April 2011, 15 students from Think Global School traveled to the Great Wall of China. William Lindsay, guide, conservationist, and adventurer, led them on a journey through ancient history, politics, and geography. Students hiked more than 15 kilometers on terra firma and brick, withstanding high winds, rain, and freezing temperatures during all times of the day. Now I'd like to tell you where you are. Uh, well, uh, China is the third largest country in the world after Russia and Canada, yeah. Uh, largest population. Uh, China is divided into 34 provincial level administrative areas. To you, maybe Chinese means yellow skin, black hair, but to China, it doesn't necessarily because there are actually 57 different ethnic groups in China. 96% of them are the Han Chinese, yeah? But the other 4% are these 56 so-called ethnic minorities, like Mongolians, Tibetans, Uyghurs, Kazakhs, Miao, and, well, these populations range from about uh, 15 million down to less than 10,000. I think there is a tribe in uh, the Guangxi uh, Autonomous Region of South China. Right now you're in the Beijing Municipality, which is one of China's smallest provincial level administrative regions. The, the Beijing Municipality for me is much more interesting than those three areas because it has 629 kilometers of Great Wall. So it's small, but it's the most wall-rich region per square kilometer uh, in the whole of China. There's different accents and there's different dialects. There's a lot of repetition, number one. People speak high volume to make sure they're understood. And also they use all kinds of sign language. And there's all sign language for numbers. One, two, three, uh, four, five, six. Six is thumb and little finger up, six. Seven, eight is like a gun, uh, nine is like a hook, and then ten is this. Yeah, ten. The villages all have the same name, uh, Shijadza, which means Western Fence. But they all have different numbers, so our village is village number four. Okay, and the numbering system goes back to the, uh, you know, those dark days of the Cultural Revolution when uh, the uh, production in the countryside was organized on a commune basis, you know. No one owned anything and everyone owned everything. Students kept walking until they reached the lookout point of the Yanshan Mountains. Well, this wall is not a single line of a wall from A to B. It has double walls has loops, it has spurs, tails, and accessories. It's a wall system, a bit like a road system. What we see here, uh, I reckon that's 15 degrees of observation. Probably that is uh, with the twists and turns. I think about uh, three kilometers of wall, and I think as the crow flies, we're two kilometers from the wall. we're seeing a tiny piece of the Ming Wall. And behind this, in Chinese history, there are at least 13 other Great Walls of China. And the earliest Great Wall, uh, according to my definition, is 300 BC. So from 300 BC until April 1644, you can do the arithmetic yourself, almost exactly 2,000 years, the Chinese were building Great Walls. How yes. long do you think that it took to build the wall? Basically in three phases. Phase one was blocking the easy invasion routes. So obviously prioritize your 
your defense requirements. If it's easy for the enemy to invade, put in a wall there. So basically, the whole frontier of China, dun, 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 dun. these are called strategic passes because the enemy knows it's an easy way in, provided by nature, a river valley cutting through these mountains, and the defenders know any uh, um, intelligence invader is going to take this route. And in between, the mountains are quite high, or there's big wedges of desert, which act as natural defences. Phase two was building independent towers between all these separate parts of the wall, so there was a line of sight linking everything up. And this is so the wall system could function as a signalling line for the transmission of military information along the wall and south to the Imperial City. Then the third phase of construction late in the Ming Dynasty, when the project had momentum, uh, when the taxes were rolling in, when things were riding on the crest of a wave, was to link everything up, no matter how difficult it was to build a wall, link everything up. And then the wall system um, graduated to a new use. It became a wall over the mountaintop, so it was very effective for the deployment of forces in response to those signals. Awaiting the students was a local cuisine consisting of Xinjiang tiger salad, trout, gung bao chicken, and pork ribs with potatoes. After eating a hearty dinner, everyone went to sleep early in order to be ready for their first encounter with the Great Wall the next morning. Remember, this is the Ming Dynasty Great Wall of China, built between 1368 and 1644. It is the world's most labor-intensive, time and material-consuming construction project in human history. More material, more men, more centuries than any other building. Without these towers and guards along the whole length of the wall, this wall wouldn't work. It would just be like a shield on the table. But by having men up here, they pick up the shield and their sword and it becomes an active defense. In many ways, this wall is so great because Genghis Khan and the Mongols did conquer China. And then when the Chinese regained control of their own country, they didn't want it to happen again. So they made sure this would work. But there's also the misconception that you know, this is just a great big pile of stones thrown together across the country from west to east. Uh, but actually, it's very strategically laid out. But I think you can uh, sense the shape of the wall here has a reason, this curve. So if the enemy is coming up this gully, the defenders can fire at them face on and from the side. So, apart from occupying the high ground, the Ming Wall was built specifically to enable the troops to fire at the enemy from various angles. This is a great advantage. Uh, are there any superstitions? Uh, well, there's the very, uh, probably the most famous legend about the Great Wall, which tells that uh, when the builders uh, died, uh, they were buried inside the wall, yeah? Mm -hmm. Their bodies became a building material. Uh, but uh, actually, uh, all the wall I've walked over the last 25 years, I've never seen any human remains in the wall. And there was a, a small survey um, about 10 years ago. Actually, I took part in that documentary and they uh, probed the wall with uh, ultrasound, um, a mud wall, 
and there were no bodies there. Now, it seems that, you know, especially for this wall, it was built by military families in the Ming Dynasty. If their, um, you know, family members died, then the family would give them a traditional burial down in the, in the valleys, rather than just having them put in the wall. Okay, let's go. Uh -huh. Physically exhausted from the arduous trek on the endless wall, students returned to rest. After a long nap, everyone ate lunch and shared their Great Wall experiences in their Think Global School journals. Ready to go! <laughs> Corner there, bring it to that corner. Are you gonna sleep there? <laughs> it's really rich. Let's go down and help. Yes, I give Success. you gift. Success. Yeah, I'll be back with it. the other one. Oh, don't worry, I'm not sitting there. I think I'm gonna just burst by a tent. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Now we got to Never a tall day and TG, yes, love. Now we have to. Ready? Yeah. One, two, two three. three. <laughs> A handful of intrepid explorers walked back to the wall to see the sunset. When all were back at the campsite, a Chinese dinner was served. I've already said this is one of the most uh, beautiful, spectacular, uh, stunning views, wallscapes, in uh, my eyes. And it's also one of the most strategic locations on the whole Great Wall of China. And as you look around, you can see wall all over the place. On this ridge, we were over there yesterday morning in the uh, drizzle and the fog. So this is the main line of wall coming from the east, from the Yellow Sea. And then you see at the top of the mountain there, there seems to be a division. In fact, there is. So this is the northern line. And then the southern line, you can see zigzagging away there. Uh, that location is called the Y. Right, and these two walls, the northern line and the southern line, uh, diverge, uh, but eventually join up again. 700 kilometers to the west on the east bank of the Yellow River. And these two walls, uh, in perimeter, measure uh, about 1,500 kilometers. And then behind us up there, there's a tower and there's a tail wall going down there. And from the uh, hill down there, there's another tail wall going down there. So there's lots of divisions and uh, tails. Very strategic area. Why? Because uh, through the mountains there as the crow flies, 100 kilometers is Beijing. Now, city of 20 million. But in uh, 1402, that is the place where um, 
the Yongle Emperor, the third emperor of the Ming Dynasty, decided to build a new capital of China. We have such you know, magnificent great wall to look at today. You know, if you're going to protect the ancient city, well, one wall through the mountains, that's going to be pretty good. It's going to be even better if you have multiple walls. These loops and spurs create trapping mechanisms. If the enemy does get through, the defenders have a second chance. I know this sounds funny, but did the Mongols actually try to come through this this area? Because it looks like even if you were nomads trying to get in, I'm sure there'd be much easier passes to get through yes. rather than these mountains. Yeah, of course. Well, uh, across the northern frontier, there were places relatively easy to invade and places that were difficult. And of course, the invaders, if they had any sense, any uh, intelligence behind their attacks, they targeted the easy access routes. So the easy access routes are basically expressway routes provided by nature. So we're talking about river valleys through these mountains. But the Chinese knew that. That's where they started to build their defences early in the Ming Dynasty. The so-called strategic passes. And um, after those, were, those uh, vulnerable locations were blockaded, uh, there was that second phase of building. Uh, the beginning of the Ming Wall, of course, was not the Emperor saying, OK, take an army and it's going to be a long project. Uh, we're going to build it from uh, Jiayiguan uh, in the west to Shanghaiguan in the east. Go. It wasn't like that. Of course, the building began in the places where it was needed. Many places at the same time, strategic passes. So if you look at a map of China, uh, a lot of these places end with the same character, Guan or Ko. Okay? So, for example, Badaling is at Juyong Guan, uh, Shanghai Guan by the coast, uh, Gubei Ko just up there, and um, uh, Yumen Guan, uh, Zijin Guan, all of these uh, characters signifies some natural opening, either a coastal plain or a river valley that the enemy could easily come through, but that's where the wall began. Okay, so what you see before you is a great landscape, but what is it? It's the Great Wall of China. And I think you start to realize that the Great Wall uh, of the Ming, the Great Wall of the Han, uh, the Great Wall of the Qin, all of these are very special uh, defense, uh, we can call uh, ideologies, strategies, policies, systems in China. And they need to be defined. Problem is, people who publish dictionaries, they think, oh, the Great Wall is a place. Places go on maps and you put the name of the place in the index so on and so on, but that's not right. There should be a definition of this wall in a dictionary. And it should read something like this. A Great Wall of China is an ancient military defense of that country, linear and of extraordinary length, built in the north on imperial orders to defend the land from nomadic invasion. The human use of the wall, natural uh, occupation of the wall, these issues are very uh, important and becoming more and more poignant. In many places the, the vegetation on top of the wall is quite mature and it's holding the uh, material together with its root system. If you took that out, there would be many voids in the pavement beneath us and those uh, voids would be exploited by water, you know, during the rainy season. Um, human use of the wall, of course, since this wall was abandoned in 1644, humans have used and abused it. Um, uh, early on, of course, um, the troops 
once the army had been disbanded, they probably stole the uh, valuable or useful parts of it. The wooden doors, wooden shutters, any tablets engraved with characters that they thought might have future value. Now, in the modern era, uh, you know, the last 20 years as China's society has changed, it's become wealthier, roads have got better, there's more free time. Um, well, thousands of kilometers of wild wall, which were out of reach uh, a short while ago, are now within reach. Um, so there's the issue of responsible use, uh, self-stewardship, um, and also, of course, the wall is such a famous building. Uh, it's a major tourist attraction. It's on the top of many people's lists coming to China. They want to see it. There's millions of people wanting to uh, stand on the wall every year. So we need tourist areas, definitely. Um, uh, I think uh, to ensure the, uh, the continuation of things, we need to uh, basically have an appreciation of them and sustainable, sensible use of them. You might say, us walking along here is damaging the wall. Well, I think everything we do in life, we're damaging the planet to a certain extent, aren't we? Um, but we've got to minimize it, minimize our carbon footprint and uh, walk carefully and leave history undisturbed. Um, I mean, some people might say, well, you know, leading people here, you're damaging the wall. Uh, and I might say to a developer who has his eyes on this, well, your plans to rebuild this wall and put in a cable car here are more damaging indeed. I think uh, protecting the wall, it's, there's a few issues. There's the physical protection, and then there's the protection of the wall's integrity and spirituality. So I think uh, uh, when I go to a site like Badaling, uh, I can see the masses enjoying themselves. You stand on the summit of the wall at Badaling, and uh, yeah, the line of the wall looks quite impressive. But, uh, you know, the many, uh, uh, acres of car parks down in the valleys are a real eyesore. Yeah. So, uh, I hope uh, the conservation of the wall will be more successful in future. Otherwise, for sure, uh, when we come here in, well, could be five, 10, 20 years time, this could be decimated by mega tourism construction.